The passage today is Galatians 3. Hopefully it will be working on the screen behind me. If not, you can find it in your own text. It's Galatians chapter 3. All of it. And kids will dismiss you in a moment, but I want you to be here for the reading of the word. We'll do what we can, Scotty. Thank you so much for your help. Galatians chapter 3. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, you are now trying to finish by means of the flesh. Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed in faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. Come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise, but God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed whom the promise referred had come, The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now, this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. Uh, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Kids, you're dismissed. Thank you, Kathy. Really appreciate your service. We have been on different words. Two weeks ago, in Galatians 1, 
We talked about how legalism does not add to the cross. It actually says the cross is insufficient. We talked about the fact that legalism is attractive because we are broken sinners. We said that legalism gives us a measuring stick, a checklist, a a list of do's and don'ts so we know, am I being holy? Well, let me check the list. And it can give us a feeling of superiority. Well, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and you're not. I'm therefore better than you. Last week, we talked about Peter, and we said that Peter, through his legalism, through his withdrawing from the Gentiles, was communicating something, that because of legalism, the Gentiles were not good enough to eat with Peter, eat with this important man in the church. Paul vehemently opposed this and said, no, absolutely not. What you are communicating is that they are not good enough, and we need to shame them into believing better. This week, Paul, in his frustration at the church, the church of Galatia, comes back. And what we're going to be talking about is actually very specifically legalism itself. Not what legalism does in regards to the cross, not what legalism does in regards to one another, but rather legalism itself, what we are doing and what we are adding to this work, to the scriptures. And when we, when we think about legalism, one of the difficulties that we have is that when it comes to Scripture, the Bible had a very specific idea in mind when it wants to talk about works of the law versus works of faith. So over here, you have works of the law that Paul is talking about. And he is referring to the law, the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, where God lays out who, what it is to be an Israelite. And then over here, Paul is talking about works of the faith by believing, works of the Spirit, which are done through faith in Christ alone. Nothing else is added to faith and legalism. Even though we have some buzzwords for that, we kind of understand. But when it comes to Scripture, how does this relate to us today? How do we struggle with legalism? And what what might we have to get rid of or sacrifice or let go of to follow Scripture better. And it's an interesting question. I heard a story recently, and this is kind of a silly story. Um, it was a story of, uh, from a guy who was on a cheerleading squad in uh, college, and he ended up being the captain. And they ended up adding to the regiment that these cheerleaders would regularly go through. See, before they could just show up and be cheerleaders, no problem. But then these two captains said, actually, we need you to work out like two hours a week. So they weren't working out before, but they were now. So what these two had done was added to what this group understood cheerleading to be. We do this in a lot of different sports. Well, we'll say, hey, you can't just show up and play baseball or football or tennis or soccer. You need to train and and do these other works to, to be a soccer player. In that case, that's not legalism. But I wanted to give you some idea of what might be happening, what we're doing. We're taking the gospel of freedom, which says, in faith, believing in Christ, you are redeemed. That's it. Now what comes after that, that's where we have this razor-thin wire of what it means. What Paul is going to talk about today are behaviors that are natural. Let's talk about the law. What is the law? So the law, all the way back in the Old Testament, is given to Israel in Exodus. So here's the stage. Israel is over here. They're in chains, bonded to Pharaoh. And God shows up with Moses and Aaron, and he rescues his people. He redeems them from the chains of slavery, leads them through the desert to where they are free. And before Mount Sinai, God says, will you do everything I command and be my people? And they say, yes. So God says, okay. And in that, will you do what my commands? It's, I have just redeemed you. I've led you through the desert. I led you through uh, the Red Sea. I've parted all of these waters. I've done everything I can to rescue you, to save you, to bring you to me. Will you now obey my commands? 
Remember, God always defines who we are before he says, this is what my people look like or live like. Now, in the Old Testament, Israel was a culture, a group of people. It was a very specific group of people. And so a lot of the law is not simply, hey, don't kill somebody. Don't uh, murder. Don't steal. Don't uh, create a false testimony against somebody. Most of the law is actually cultural. Don't eat this type of food. Don't wear these types of garments or clothes. Don't shave. Don't wear tattoos. Don't do piercings. This is what you do regularly hold all year as a way to celebrate and honor and give thanks to me. Here are the sacrifices that I want you to pick, some of which are for sin, but some of which are for thanksgiving. The grain offering was a thanksgiving offering. It was given to God, burned for God, to say, God, thank you for providing food. Here is a portion of my harvest that I'm going to surrender to God in faith and trust that we will still be able to eat. And as a thank you, we do something with tithing where we take a portion of our money and we say, God, I'm going to surrender this money back to your church, to your mission, to your ministry, and I'm going to give this to you and trust that you will continue to provide the finances that I need to live. Most of the law is cultural law. It's for Israel specifically to be Israelites that is unique to them. So what's happening in Galatians with this church is that these Judaizers have come and perhaps in really good, faithful representation of what they believe the gospel is. And they've come up here. Imagine you're the Gentile church. Paul told you the gospel is by faith. And largely, you're still living like you used to. Maybe you're not participating in the old temple worship anymore. Hopefully you're not. Maybe hopefully you're not participating in all the forms of that temple worship, some of which are very inappropriate. Hopefully you are living your life for God. Everything that you do is for the glory of the kingdom, where you're learning more about him, you're reading maybe these letters coming in from various church leaders, and then all of a sudden, based on their searching of scripture, that you are not actually a Christian. You see, to be Jew meant to hold these cultural practices, and it has been that way since the Exodus until even today, modern times. There are many Jews who still hold to these testaments, these regiments, these kosher eating laws, all of it. Hold to it today. Because they believe that God called them to be Jewish or Israelites, and Israelites follow these commands. Paul in Galatians, and to the church, and to these Judaizers have been arguing, no, those aren't necessary. In fact, they're a hindrance to the gospel. So what they were saying, these Judaizers, they come up to you and they say, listen, it is by faith that you're saved, but a Christian is not going to eat bacon. And if you touch blood, you're going to have to go and get yourself cleansed. And you probably shouldn't shave anymore. And uh, definitely don't wear mixed fiber clothing. Just real quick, how many of you write? You're breaking the law. You are guilty. We don't live under that law anymore. Some of you might have tattoos or piercings, which in the Old Testament law is a sin, but we've not carried that forward to modern day. How many of you shaved this morning? Men, maybe even the ladies. But men specifically, you trimmed your beard. I trimmed my beard completely off. I am violating the law. And so these Judaizers are coming to this church in Galatia and said, you are violating the law, and so therefore you are not being a good Christian. You are sinning against God. Your faith is not very strong. And so yes, you've been saved, but you need to do these normal Jewish practices. So men, better not see clean faces next week. No mixed fibers, I'll be checking at the door. None of it. What's well, ridiculous? We wouldn't do that. That's not who we are. Listen, it's cheap to wear a 50% cotton, 50% polyester shirt. And they don't shrink in the wash. This shirt. Cotton, you're so comfortable. Why do you shrink? That's the law. That's what the Judaizers wanted to do, is to come in and say, you need to not eat bacon. No ham. 
No pork of any kind. Certain types of fish are out. Certain types of uh, animals that we do like to eat nowadays are out. They're gone. You can't ever eat them again. The most common one for us, though, is pork. Mm. Love a good pork. My wife's family takes pork tenderloins, and they lay them on a cast iron skillet and fry all the edges to brown them, and then bury them in stewed tomatoes and pop it in the oven for an hour. <sighs> gone. <laughs> Never again. You can't eat that. So what do we do that's similar? How many of you in your life have had someone come to you and say, you know, this behavior you're doing, I think it doesn't make you a good Christian. Maybe in regards to socially drinking alcohol. Maybe in regards to uh, whether or not you go to a dance or watch a movie. Paul, in this first part of Galatians 3, is just hammering over and over again, this is not the way. It is not about following the law. You are not bound to the law of the land. There were only a couple of restrictions. Four, that uh, James and Peter and the council of the church gave to the Gentiles when they were becoming Christians. One of them, don't commit sexual immorality. And that was probably, likely, specifically, temple worship. Put it that way. And that was worship. That was worship. And they said, no, that is not okay. That's off the table. Also, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Paul will later come back and say, it doesn't actually matter. But if your brother struggles with that, maybe he's a Jewish man who takes this very seriously, and he sees you just wolfing down the feast with everyone else, he might feel like you've sinned. That might be a stumbling block for him. Don't eat meat around him. We have a common thing today. If you know someone who is an alcohol, a recovering alcoholic, what do you make sure you do not do in front of them? You don't drink. You don't have any alcohol, any beer in front of them. This is just one-on-one. You don't do it because you don't want to cause them to stumble. You would do this in front of any addict. You're not going to take a gambling addict to a casino. You're asking them to fail. And you're not going to necessarily pull out a lotto ticket and scratch it off in front of them. You're going to be sensitive to their struggles and their unique limitations and in their own broken way. Because we have those. We have all those same temptations, those same brokenness. But Paul says the law is not how we are saved and adding to faith in Christ, even in these normal human practice ways, takes away from the gospel. It means the gospel's not enough. The cross is not enough. We like these, right? We like to know that if I don't dance or listen to the right type of music or if I don't drink or, or wear certain types of clothes, then I know that I'm doing good. I want to take a moment here because I know for some of us, and I'm going to throw myself in here when it comes to alcohol, this can be kind of weird to hear. I grew up basically hearing that alcohol was a horrific thing. Never drink it. It's awful. I had a friend tell me once that a, a sipping Christian is a slipping Christian, which I bit my tongue. I should have said something that, you know, that's not in Scripture, so I don't, that means nothing to me. But I did grow up thinking alcohol is wrong. Shouldn't do it. Now, as I've matured and I've kind of studied Scripture and I've looked at it, for me, probably, I rarely, if ever, drink anything. It's just not my thing. But it's not my job to look at another Christian and say, okay, you are not a Christian or being a good Christian because you do. That's between them and God, and I'll call out drunkenness. I'll call out that step further. That is definitely a sin. But until that point, they have to wrestle with God about what is appropriate or proper or right. Same thing with music, same thing with dancing. You can personally feel, I don't know that this is right for Christians to do, but we are allowed in the freedom of the gospel to interact with one another and say, hey, listen, we just disagree a little bit. And that's part of the beauty, this might be weird to hear, part of the beauty of denominations is that we can say, listen, the church over there, they love to dance and, and, and celebrate that way. Maybe we don't, and that's okay. That is okay. It is okay that perhaps we don't want to dance. Perhaps we don't think that it's proper or appropriate. Perhaps we feel, here's a, here's a great example. 
I've seen a pastor wear nice shoes, clean jeans, and a t-shirt to preach in. And that's acceptable. That's normal. That's okay. It depends on where you are and what you feel is appropriate. And then to pursue that end. That's what Paul's looking for. He's not looking for us to, to create these rules and these lists because that goes against the gospel. But rather, through fear and trembling, putting our faith in God, we work out our faith as God works in us. That's what Paul says in Philippians. We work out our faith. We figure out what works for us, what doesn't. And we faithfully and humbly engage in conversations with one another, accepting that maybe we're wrong. Maybe they're wrong. But we've got to be humble to know that we don't know everything, and we have to just do our best to worship God and trust that the Holy Spirit is leading us and guiding us. That's the law. Now, a a brief note. Some of you might be wondering, hold on, 5, starting in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20. It feels like Paul and Jesus might disagree here. The surface level, if you, if you don't really look at the context around what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying the law is required and important. We have to obey it follow it, not get rid of it. And it feels like, on the other hand, Paul over here is saying, no, the law is unimportant. Don't follow it. Follow by faith in Christ. That is where you're at. The truth is somewhere in the middle. You see, Jesus is, in, in in a way, kind of calling out the Pharisees. Because, you see, the Pharisees were adding to or removing elements of the law, their version of legalism, creating extra weights and burdens for people to carry. Listen, it's not enough, right, to not sit in a chair that a woman who is on her period sat in. Perhaps you should burn the chair too or get rid of it or don't even stay in the same room. This is kind of an extreme. I don't believe that was an example, but that's the type of thing they would do. Listen, God said don't work on the Sabbath. Jesus, you reaching your hand out and healing a man on the Sabbath, that is work. And in no way did God ever imagine or even conceive that that is what he wanted them to do or think. But the Pharisees were adding to the law. They were adding burdens. They were removing some from themselves. They were not carrying the same burdens as the common person. This would be like me saying to you, none of you can... Uh, dance or enjoy movies or go out and see a football game, but I can because I'm holy and I know scriptures really well and I've really have attained the special. I would hope none of you would ever accept that from your pastor. That a pastor would require legalism from you while he himself is not willing to lift that burden with you. That is not right. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. So Jesus is calling them out. And Jesus is going to fulfill the law for us. He is going to complete the law, obey it fully, do everything right, and then become a curse for us. This is something that Paul says. So if you go back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, curses everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So, back to what we were talking about earlier. I heard it once, people were talking about don't ever get tattoos and piercings as a Christian. That's wrong. But here's the thing. In that same chapter, is the beards, 
and then no mixed fiber threads. If you don't obey all of the law, you should obey none of it, because if you obey a part of it, you are required to obey all of it. With no exception, no ifs, ands, or buts, that's the rule. That's the purpose of the law. If you're going to do it, you've got to go all in and do everything you can to not sin. Paul continues, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous live by faith. This is taken from uh, Habakkuk, I believe. Um, the righteous live by faith. So if you are righteous in God, even in Old Testament times, you lived by faith in God. Micah 6, 8 says this too, or God lays out this charge against Israel that they are not faithfully following him, obey him. And the people respond, what do you want? Would more rams, more sacrifices, thout, like rivers of olive oil, would that satisfy you? What is God's response in Micah 6, 8? I've required none of these things from you except to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with me. The requirements of the law are a Jewish requirement, but that is not what saves, and that is not what God is really looking for. God is looking for holiness and purity. Not ritualistic purity, but purity of the heart. The ritualistic purity was supposed to help lead the people of Israel towards actual purity. The law was meant to be a guardian to lead people towards righteousness. But because of the nature of the law and our brokenness, Paul tells us here in Galatians 3 that by living there, we are actually shackled to sin. He says elsewhere, he'll be able to say, look, I have told you what sin is and you are doing it. But Christ, by dying for our sins on the cross and raising again, by living his life perfectly, we have been given his righteousness. His perfected, completed, law-abiding righteousness. That is ours. When we go and we stand before the throne in judgment, we will not claim, well, I, I, I obeyed the law, or I didn't dance, or I didn't drink. We will say, no, I claim Christ and Him crucified. That is my only justification. That is all I can say before a holy and mighty God is that your Son saved me. Your Son provided for me. Your Son brought me home. I did nothing. I could not complete the task. I could not achieve perfection. I could not be more righteous than the Pharisees. But Christ did, Christ could and did, and then gave that to me. And so I claim him and him alone. That is the life that we are called to live. That this law curses us. Every time we add stuff to what it means to be a good Christian, it is cursing us. But life is something different. Paul talks about how in Abraham, real quick, chapter, eight, uh, chapter 15, Abraham has been called from his city, given this promise that the nations will be blessed by you, and the Lord appears to make a covenant with him again. And he says this, After this, a word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. This is uh, Genesis 15, if you want to look this up later. Or if you want to try and flip to it now. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And, Abraham, and Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. And here's the key critical verse. They have not even done the covenant yet. The law is not going to come for another 430 years. That's what Paul tells us. Verse 6 of chapter 15 in Genesis. Abraham believed God. God just said, I'm going to give you a son, and that son is going to be your heir. The, the seed that I'm talking about is going to come through this particular son. And you're going to have kids 
more vast than the stars or the sands along the sea that you can't even count. And Abraham believed God. There was no exchange. There was no deal making. Not, I'm going to give you a son if you obey these things. Just, I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham said, okay, I'm going to trust you. Abraham believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, credited it to him, Abraham, or Abram at this point, as righteousness. So outside of the law, what Paul is saying here is that we have been given a promise through Abraham by faith. And that the law came later to explain sin and also create the expectations of God that Jesus will later fulfill. If you jump to Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says this, Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. So the law oversaw us, cared for us. Unfortunately, that care led us to harm. We could not complete the law. We could not fulfill the law. But it was there until Christ came. Verse 25. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. The law has been fulfilled. All children of God through faith, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, or Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to a promise. We are called not to obey the law. We are called to live by faith. Talking to God, learning from God, trusting in one another, talking to one another, learning from each other, because that's how the Holy Spirit works in us, in that there is no one who is unique or special because of any one practice or lack of practice they do. There is not Jew nor Greek, Jew nor Gentile in Christ. There is not slave nor free. There's not even man or woman. In Christ, we are one. We are equal in faith. If we believe, then we belong to Abraham. We are children of Abraham, brought into the promises that God gave to Abraham all those thousands of years ago. When it comes to When it comes to talking about laws and practices, it can be challenging to figure out what, what we want to do. There's been wisdom in some of the restrictions that we placed on Christians in the past. Alcohol is a great one. Alcohol is insanely destructive. It's destroyed entire families. It has caused all sorts of infidelity, destruction, chaos, drunk driving accidents. Alcohol is awful. But it's not a requirement that Christ has placed on Christians. What is a requirement that God has placed on us? Because remember, God defines who we are and then he does tell us what we live like. And I'm going to go back to Ephesians 4.1. I, Paul, prisoner of the Lord, therefore urge you now to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Okay? The calling was the first three chapters. What is Paul going to say now? Humility, unity, faith, generosity, kindness, compassion. He's going to get into this in the next two chapters. We're going to briefly touch on the fruit of the Spirit because he's going to talk about that. What does life by the faith look like? Life by the Spirit look like? That's the fruit of the Spirit that we just covered. God does not say, don't wear mixed fiber threads or don't shave your beard. He says instead, compassion, generosity, humility, Unity, striving to understand one another and love one another and be with one another, that is what is required of Christianity. There are no cultural laws on Christians. Unless you're Jewish and you want to embrace that. Messianic Jews, we talked about it briefly last week. There are no laws in Christianity apart from as God said in Micah, to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. To seek humility, unity, 
patience, and grace. Those are the things required of Christians. But we cannot say that someone is being a bad Christian because they do something that we personally think they shouldn't be doing unless that is clearly and obviously sin. But outside of that clearly and obviously sin, we cannot hold people to a higher standard because it is not what the gospel is and is not what we have been called to live by. We've been called to live by faith, first and foremost. I would invite you, this is a, 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 a tricky sermon to preach. I would invite you, if you have questions, uh, if clarity of anything I've said today, please come talk to me. Um, I'm not perfect. I don't know everything. There's a lot I've learned from you all just being here in this church. And so if you have any comments, please come talk to me. I would love to hear you out. But this is what I'm seeing in Scripture. And I want to faithfully present that to you all. But with that, let's go to Jesus now and ask for that clarity of faith. Heavenly Father, we come to you now with a heavy scripture passage on what it means to be Christian. Things that we have disagreed about and talked about for generations now, what it means to live for you. Nearly 2,000 years of trying to get this down and nail it down and understand what's happening. And Lord, we're still not perfect. We're still trying to figure it out. And modern times bring modern problems. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us humility first. That we might seek to be patient with one another as we have these disagreements. Pray you would give us wisdom to know when those disagreements are worthy of having a conversation. Worthy of trying to understand. And that we would be given unity, Lord that at the end of the day, we would pray for one another and encourage one another to walk in faith with you and that we would strive to keep and preserve the unity of the church above all else. Lord, I pray for myself here too. For I know I'm not perfect and I know I don't have everything under control or understand everything. But I pray that you would lead us faithfully through your scriptures, faithfully through conversations with us that we might learn and grow from one another and sharpen one another. I want to give you a moment of silence or something on your heart weighing. I want to give you a moment to pray and talk to God for that. Teach us your ways. We pray all these things, Father, in the name of your Son, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.